Not a day goes by that Russia is not in the news, especially since February the 24th. In the history of Russia, one of the most familiar figures, especially in the world of writing and writers, is Leo Tolstoy. He's best known for two novels, War and Peace, 1869, and Anna Karenina, 1878. He lived for 82 years, had 13 children, was married for 48 years, and left his wife just before he died in 1910. We ask University of Virginia professor Andrew Kaufman, author of two books on Tolstoy, to give us his take on Russia and Tolstoy's attitude toward war. Professor Andrew Kaufman of the University of Virginia, you have spent your life studying Leo Tolstoy. You've written about the novel War and Peace. What can we learn from reading it about today's situation in Russia and war and Ukraine? Hi, Brian. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, so, yeah, let's get right to it. War and Peace, a book that many Russians consider, many you know people around the world consider the world's uh, greatest novel, um, written in the 1860s, is actually strikingly relevant to this moment. Um, War and Peace is a novel um, that takes place in the early 1800s, and it describes Russia's wars with Napoleon between 1805 and 1812, and ultimately uh, describes uh, Napoleon's failed invasion of Russia in 1812. Um, And it does this by bringing us uh, very close to the personal lives of uh, four main families, and they are the lens through which we experience this you know, th- these tumultuous times in Russian history. Um, and what's interesting about War and Peace is that the story that it tells, the story of Russia being invaded by a foreign power, um, is actually a very familiar story in Russian history. Um, you know, back in the 11th, 12th century, Russia was invaded by the Mongols. Uh, Napoleon's famous invasion of 1812, Hitler's invasion during World War II. And so Putin is very aware that this story of a country under siege is uh, deeply embedded in Russian cultural imagination. And so he actually plays on this story to justify his invasion of Ukraine, his idea that Russia is in a battle against the West. Uh, And so Tolstoy told a story that Putin can actually tap into and use uh, for his own political purposes. The problem is, the interesting thing is, Russia is now the invader, not the country being invaded. And of all the characters in War and Peace, the one that Putin probably most resembles is the French dictator Napoleon. Uh, And the character that Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine, most (laughs) embodies is the Russian hero of War and Peace, Russia's commander-in-chief, Kutuzov. Uh, And so um, the the story is is similar, but the the roles have been reversed. Your book called Give War... Give War and Peace a Chance, Tolstoyan Wisdom for Troubled Times, first written back in 2014. Uh, You say in the book you've read War and Peace, at least 1,100 pages War and Peace, 15 times? Uh, Well, at that point, yeah, before I had written that book. uh, My first time was, you know, some 25 years prior to that when I was a sophomore at Amherst College. That was my first encounter with War and Peace. And then I, every couple of years after that, I would reread the book, and it became a new book every time based on what was going on in my life, what was going on in the world, and it simply responded in really powerful ways to whatever that context was. So yes, when I sat down to write Give War and Peace a Chance in 2010, 2011, I had actually read War and Peace uh, about 15 times up to that point. How does it change over time when you read it again and again? Well, I think that's that's the great beauty and the mystery of a of a of a classic work of literature like War and Peace is that it uh, every generation, um, every period in a person's life, it somehow resonates with um, because it does speak to so, so profoundly to universal human beings. 
Um, and just to give you a specific example of how it became a new book for me uh, when I read it in 2008, and that was actually the impetus behind my book, uh, Give War and Peace a Chance. If you remember, 2008 was what we are today calling the Great Recession, um, and it was a time of, you know, of crisis in our country when many of our old paradigms and assumptions about, you know, our financial security, uh, even some people are questioning, you know, the very nature of capitalism, where all of that was turned on its head. Uh, and I, you know, and my family, um, you know, had personal experience with a lot of those challenges, as did millions of Americans. Well, I happened to be reading or rereading War and Peace around that time, and I saw something in the book that, interestingly, I hadn't quite seen before. I'd never quite framed the novel in that way before. What I realized is that this book is a story of a country going through a time of rupture, a time of crisis, and where people's lives are being turned upside down by the by the forces of war and social and political change and spiritual confusion. And characters are asking themselves, how do I find fulfillment and even joy in such times? And it struck me that that was exactly the question that I was asking and that so many of us were asking in the United States uh, at that time. And so I realized that War and Peace is, in fact, uh, at that time, the classic for our times. But fast forward eight years, or actually six years from 2014, the worldwide pandemic, and guess what? That was yet another paradigm-shifting, assumption-challenging experience, not just on the part of Americans, but on the part of everybody in the world. And once again, this story of people in a, in a state of crisis, people whose lives are being turned upside down, whose fundamental assumptions about the world um, are being challenged by these by these large outside forces, in this case, a pandemic. Once again, that story is the story of War and Peace, and so War and Peace is once again relevant in this new context. Tell us about Tolstoy. Uh, tell us about Tolstoy. Well, um, you know, he is most famous um, in the United States for... Some, two of his greatest masterpieces, War and Peace, of course, which he wrote in the 1860s when he was in his 30s, and Anna Karenina, which he wrote uh, about a decade later when, um, when he was in his 40s. Um, but Tolstoy was born in 1828. Uh, he, came from, he came from a long lineage of arist uh, aristocracy in Russia. He lost uh, both of his parents by... He, by the time he was a teenager, so he was essentially orphaned. And so much of his life and so much of his writing was about trying to reconnect, trying to explore people um, searching for their families, both, both literal and metaphorical. Um, in his 20s, he attended, or in his late teens, he attended uh, a university, Kazan University, and briefly studied uh, on Oriental languages. But he thought he was more intelligent. Uh, and more creative than his professors. In many cases, he probably was. Uh, but so he dropped out. He left. In fact, they asked him to leave because he wasn't the best student. And so he spent his 20s flailing around, um, not sure what he was going to do with his life. Um, he joined, you know, he was a failed estate manager. He tried to run his, you know, thousand-acre family estate, um, and he was not successful at that. He um, had a gambling addiction. He lost the house of his birth in a gambling bet. Uh, he lost 6,000 rubles one evening, uh, and the only thing the, that he had of that value that he could uh, pay off with was the house. So it was literally uh, torn down brick by brick, board by board, and hauled off to, you know, to, his, uh, to a neighboring village where the person who beat him basically owned it. Um, he also served as a soldier, and this is very important, especially in today's context. In his 20s, one of the things that he did uh, is serve as a soldier in the Caucasus region. Um, and one of the places where he served as a soldier was in Crimea. In fact, he served during the Crimean War of 1855 and 1856. And that is where he started to collect stories 
about Russia, you know, and their war efforts against foreign powers. And many of those stories would eventually crystallize into what would become war and peace. Um, but he also, uh, and this is also very important, he, he was very patriotic. He was very proud of being a Russian officer. Uh, he was very patriotic, but he was not a nationalist. He did not believe um, that Russia was superior to other nations. And that's a, an important distinction. He loved his people, but he hated the government. In fact, he described Russian soldiers as a mob of disciplined, oppressed slaves. And that, he said, was the reason that they lost the Crimean War. Um, so anyway, I'm getting off track, but I just wanted to, I wanted to offer that segue uh, into this period in Tolstoy's life because it really you know, is relevant to today. When did he, um, when when did he, he marry? Uh, he married in 1862. Um, he's 34 years old. And the next six years would be a, uh, a time of relative calm in his own life. Uh, and that is the period in which he wrote War and Peace. Um, and uh, his early marriage was, you know, successful and happy, uh, but things eventually started to fall apart, especially as Tolstoy became more extreme in his moralistic ideas. He Later on in life, after he wrote War and Peace and after he wrote Anna Karenina, he started to reject his calling as an artist, uh, as, a, as a writer of novels, and he believed that his real calling for Russian society was as a moral teacher, and so he began focusing on writing religious tracts and moral tracts um, and didn't really return to fiction writing for a couple of decades. Uh, and then, um, you know, because of his extreme, you know, moralism, um, his, his rigidity, frankly, uh, he felt compelled to give away all of the copyrights on everything he wrote uh, later on in life. And this infuriated his wife. This was the source of one of many arguments in their, in their home. She said, "How you know this is ridiculous? This is our source of income. This is your children's future. The 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 this is going to finance their future. How how can you do that?" Um, but he did it, and he also wanted to give away all of his property, um, you know. And his wife didn't let him do that either. And eventually, he ran away from home at the age of 82 after having been married almost 50 years, and he left his wife um, a fairly curt note thanking her for. 48 years of marriage, but telling her that their differences are simply irreconcilable and that he wants to go off and die alone. And he almost succeeded in doing that, except his wife got wind of where he was. He was at the stop of a train station, um, and he was very ill. I think it was um, tuberculosis. And she managed to see him in the last day of his life. Um, and... Um, but he wasn't conscious, and so it was a very... So it's really sad that this is how Tolstoy's life ended, especially when he's the creator of War and Peace, which celebrates the joys of family life as beautifully as any novel that I am familiar with. But alas, that was not his reality later on in life. On a side note, what did you think of the 2009 movie, The Last Station? Oh, um, well, I loved it. I, I loved it. It's based on the novel by Jay Perini, uh, by the same name, The Last Station. Um, and what I loved about it, a couple of things. One is, you know, from a, a scholarly perspective, it was extremely accurate. Jay Perini did his homework. He had access to English translations of the memoirs of people who knew Tolstoy and of his wife, of Tolstoy's wife. And so, he was very scrupulous in his writing of this novel, even though it was fictionalized. He wanted um, everything that we everything to be true, and so that part I really appreciated. But on a more personal level, what I appreciated about it is that it brought Tolstoy down to a very human level. We often think of these great writers in these kind of large, untouchable terms, but part of my mission, you know, in my career has been to do exactly what this film does so beautifully, is to make Tolstoy human and let people see his human failings. Um, and, and, and in that sense, we can identify with him, with the struggles of love, with the struggles between his principles and his duty to his family. And, um, and I was deeply moved by that movie. In fact, so much so I asked Jay Perini um, if he would read Give War and Peace a Chance and offer a, you know, a response to it, an endorsement, and he did, and it's actually on the front 
uh, cover of the paperback edition of the book. So that, for me, was a great honor to have um, the author of The Last Station um, to really resonate with my book as well. How often have you been to Russia? So I um, started, I have been to Russia many times, um, and it started uh, when I was a junior in college. I spent a year in Russia. Um, The first semester I was part of a a program at the Pushkin Institute, a language program for foreigners learning Russian. But then I wanted to immerse myself more deeply and more authentically into Russian culture. And so um, after the Pushkin Institute, I realized that, you know, I wanted to immerse myself more deeply and more authentically into Russian culture. So I applied as an independent student to Moscow State University. Uh, I was accepted, and um, that allowed me to spend another semester studying, um, you know, as a as a Russian student. And that is where I took courses in Russian literature. Um, I got to know a um, a woman whose husband was the editor of a major literary journal, and so she invited me to the Soviet Writers Union, the Soviet Writers Union retreat, where I got to know other writers. Um, and, and she and I studied, um, you know, Russian classics together. And it was, you know, it was kind of a, a tutorial situation that was really powerful. And that is when I realized that, you know, I love this stuff. Um, and it really came alive for me. And so I went to graduate school eventually, uh, came back to Amherst College. And then a couple of years later, I, I went to Stanford to pursue my Ph.D., in Slavic languages and literatures, and I spent, you know, pretty much every summer I would go back to Russia. But I wasn't just immersed in the literary scene. I also worked as a management consultant in Russia. Uh, I actually worked one summer for Bain and Company, which is a management strategy consulting firm. And then I had my own consulting practice with a couple of Russian partners. So I got to witness Russia not just from the cultural side, but I also got to witness what was sometimes referred to as the wild, wild uh, east which was Russia in the 1990s. Russia was trying to make its transition into a capitalist economy and privatization and all of that. And so I, I got to witness that firsthand as well. Um, and, you know, and I had been going back to Russia in different capacities after that ever since. I will tell you, Brian, um, I would not go to Russia right now. Um, I think as an American, it's dangerous. And for me, that's very sad because I love Russia. I love the time that I spend there. I love the people. Um, There's just uh, a certain, you know, a a fondness that I have for the country, obviously. But right now, um, it would be dangerous, I think, for an American, any American, to travel in Russia. And I don't know how long that's going to last. How how do you explain why the Russian people aren't kicking back on this kind of situation in Ukraine? Um, Well, I think it's a couple of things. One is Putin's extremely successful um, clampdown on the media, right? The combination of censorship and also the threat of imprisonment. If you so much as use the word war or invasion to describe what is going on. Um, And so it's that combination of, you know, the censorship and also, frankly, the threats of prison is very effective. But I even think there's a deeper reason, and it gets back to what we talked about uh, right at the top of the hour, which is that the story that Putin is telling Russians, that we are a country under siege, that the West is out to get us, and that we need to be proud and defiant and aggressive and all of that, in order to protect ourselves, that that, in fact, is the source of our national greatness. That story is deeply embedded in Russian consciousness. That is um, very similar to the story of War and Peace, which is about Russia's literal invasion by Napoleon. Um, And so because that story resonates so deeply, I think people are more inclined to believe the, uh, the, um, you know, the media falsehood. And to believe Putin's, you know, line of argument that we are under threat. Um, of course, he's a very bad leader of war and peace because that is not the message at all of war and peace. War and peace celebrates, you know, Russia, he, Russian humility, not their hubris. Uh, Tolstoy wrote um, that there is no greatness where there is no goodness, simplicity, and truth. 
There is no greatness where there is no goodness, simplicity, and truth. And that, for Tolstoy, was the source of Russian greatness, not the kind of militaristic hubris and aggressiveness that we see on Putin's part. And yet the story resonates. The story seems to make sense. That, yeah, we are a country under siege. So maybe, you know, President Putin is right. Because of uh, reading your book and other things that you've uh, talked about, and I've watched some of the talks you've made, I, I find my way to the book that Tolstoy wrote called Confession. Uh, short, 37 pages on the Internet. It's free. You can read it if you want to. Uh, what impact did that particular book have on you, and why do you think he wrote that, and what, how's that fit into the story of Tolstoy? So it fits in in this way. Um, after he published War and Peace, uh, it's finished in 1869, he started to go through a, um, a spiritual crisis. Uh, he started to doubt everything that he had done with his life up to that point. He questioned whether spending his time as an artist, as the author of novels like War and Peace, was even worth it. In fact, he even called War and Peace uh, verbose gibberish after he wrote it. Um, and the impetus for this crisis was actually an event in his life where after War and Peace, he had a windfall. He had, you know, a windfall. And so he used some of that money to go buy additional land. And on his way to that purchase, he had a nervous breakdown in a hotel in the village of Adizamas. Um, and it led to a very severe, um, a severe, you know, multi-week series of panic attacks. Uh, and he even, asked, when he returned home, he asked his wife to hide the knives and the guns and the ropes in the house because he feared he would kill himself. And, and, and But that was the beginning of this long, you know, existential quest of, okay, I've done it. I've written, you know, one of the world's great novels. I've got a thousand acres. You know, I have an income of, in today's money, you know, high hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why am I doing this? What is the purpose? What is the deeper purpose of my life? And so he went through a long period of spiritual searching where he read philosophers and theologians and really searching for the answer to, you know, how I should live. What is the purpose of life? And Confession tells the story of that search and tells the story of his shift and his realization that now his priorities need to be different, that he is no longer going to, quote-unquote, waste his time writing novels like War and Peace. He's going to focus on more moralistic works and spiritual treatises. He even rewrote the gospel, getting rid of what he thought were, you know, mistakes that the author of the gospels had made, had made focusing too much on the symbolism uh, of the gospels. Uh, and Tolstoy just stripped it down to the practical life wisdom and the spiritual wisdom that the gospels offered. So he wrote his own version of the gospels, and all. And, and Confession tells this, tells this. Uh, this story. And the way it fits into his life is, on the one hand, it does mark a shift in his life, where he does become less interested in writing novels and more interested in writing treatises and, and religious works. Um, but it also is an embodiment of that spiritual crisis that he had been in for all of his life. It's not like the first time that Tolstoy had a spiritual crisis, that Tolstoy was searching for the meaning of his life. That is a fundamental part of his personality. And we see that in War and Peace. All of his characters, but certainly the major uh, heroes and heroines in this book, are, are, are searching for, you know, a life that has meaning and fulfillment to them. So a crisis uh, confession just was in the expression of that quest, you know, at a particular moment in life and in an extreme form. But this search for meaning, it's so fundamental to Tolstoy from the very beginning of his career right to the very end. If he were a politician today in the United States and you read this, you would possibly call him a flip-flopper from the beginning of his life until the end of his life, including the fact that at one time you say he was very active sexually before he got married, and then at the end he walked away from any kind of sexual contact at all. Explain that. <laughs> explain, explain that. Um, yeah, well, Tolstoy, as you allude to, was, you know, one of the greatest authors who ever lived, also happened to be one of the most flawed uh, 
human beings who ever lived. Um, he had many failings, including his, you know, uh, unbridled libido. Uh, he sired uh, a, a, um, a child to a local pe- with a local peasant girl. He had a gambling addiction, as I mentioned. He lost his house. Later on in life, you know, he gave up his copyrights. He makes really impractical decisions. And then he runs, runs away from home at the age of 82. Um, and, of course, later on in life, he also wrote um, the Kreutzer Sonata, which was an argument against, you know, sex in all forms. And everything else he wrote was against materialism and against, you know, all the things that he kind of grew up with. So he was a man of contradictions. Um, but people are like that. Part, if, if Tolstoy was a perfect human being, then, then War and Peace would be a perfectly boring novel. What makes this novel and all of his writings so rich and so human and so relatable is that precisely because he was flawed, precisely because of his contradictions and his quirks and all of that, and the reason I think that is important um, today is because we live in a very divisive time where people, you know, side with their team. People divide along ideological lines or political lines. And like you mentioned, yeah, people would call Tolstoy a flip-flopper. Well, most rich lives are full of changes. People change their mind. People have failings at one point, and then they redeem themselves, hopefully. Um, And sometimes they don't. And so... I just think by calling attention to Tolstoy's profound humanity and the profound humanity, the complex humanity of all, it's an important reminder in this moment that people are complex, that people transcend stereotypes and labels and ideologies. And when we insist on forcing people into those boxes, it's a kind of dehumanization, that we are so much more interesting and rich than that. And Tolstoy's life and all of these characters' lives transcend those categories. Um, yeah, so thank you for asking that question. Go back to your time in Moscow and in Russia. Uh, how, first of all, did you go to his home uh, when you were there? So, yes, Tolstoy, uh, there are actually multiple homes. He, His main home, where he grew up, he spent almost most of his 82 years, where he wrote almost all of his uh, masterpieces, was Yasnaya Polyana, which is a 1,000-acre estate about 200 kilometers south southwest, uh, I think, of Moscow. Um, and so I spent a lot of time at Yasnaya Polyana, in part because of, you know, uh, friendships and scholars that I knew there and research that I was doing. But also I wanted to experience what it, what it felt like to live in such a place, what it felt like to, to wander in a state of a thousand acres with ravines and fields and ponds and paths and woods and, and everything, and, and really to get a sense of Tolstoy's environment in which he created. And by doing that, I actually started to appreciate how he was able to write a book like War and Peace, because even though War and Peace describes a very tumultuous time in Russian history. And even though Tolstoy was himself living in the 1860s in a tumultuous time, he also managed to somehow transcend that. He managed to look at the big picture. He managed to appreciate the eternal truths of human nature, of nature itself, the beauty of nature. Um, There's an expansiveness and a hopefulness and, frankly, a deep love of humanity that pervades the pages of War and Peace that you feel when you are physically present in the place where he wrote that novel, Yasna Polyana. And so it gave me an insight into Tolstoy that no book or no document could have done. Um, And Tolstoy's other home, of course, he bought later in life, is in Moscow, uh, and that is a home where he uh, spent time, and I think he wrote Resurrection in that other home. Um, It is also a museum um, today and while I should say, uh, you know, while in Yasna Polyana, I got to know members of the Tolstoy family, of uh, Vladimir Tolstoy, who is the the great um, the great great grandson of Tolstoy, who is the director of the Tolstoy Museum and Estate at Yasna Polyana, and I also met his um, his nephew, uh, 
Um, and we became friends. And, you know, he invited me to his wedding a couple of years later. And I think for whatever reason, well, that's, a, that's another story. But uh, um, so it was just fascinating. to. In fact, when I was giving a talk uh, at Yasmin Poignan, I was talking about Tolstoy giving away the copyright to his works. And uh, one of the members uh, of the audience, um, you know, one of the Tolstoys, the great, great uh, grandson said, well, yeah, that was the right thing to do because he didn't want his works of art to be turned into commodities. He didn't want them, you know, he, he, that's why he, uh, he didn't want, um, yeah, he, he wanted it for all people. Uh, and then the great, great, great grandson said, well, hold on, wait just a minute here. And he was in his early 20s at the time. He was a student at Moscow State. He said, wait just a minute. You know, morality is one thing, but he also needed to feed his family. He also had a responsibility to his kids. So it's fascinating to watch these two generations of Tolstoy debating a decision that one of their great ancestors had made like 100 years earlier. Have you read any of his diaries? Yes. Yeah, so as part of my research for Give War and Peace a chance, I read... Um, most of his diaries. I mean, Tolstoy wrote 90 volumes. The complete collected works of Tolstoy is 90 volumes. So I can't claim that I've read, read every single page of those 90 volumes. But his diaries I did read um, very carefully. And I was especially, uh, his diaries in his 20s make absolute fascinating reading. Because, remember, I mentioned earlier that that was a time in his life when he was completely flailing about. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He had, you know, all, you know, he was a gambling, had a gambling addiction. He was sleeping around with Asiatic beauties. I mean, he's, you know, he was served in the caucuses. And to read his diary is to get a real insight, almost a, a humorously morbid insight, into a young man um, who was extremely volatile and extremely um, searching, and extremely arrogant, um, you know, very critical. You see him studying people and talking about people that he meets in his diary, and should any of those people have ever read what he wrote, they would you know, never talk to him again. And yet that kind of close study of people is what was essential for his novel writing. Um, so, yes, The Young Tolstoy is something I recommend every young person read because, A, it'll make you feel better about your life, and, B, It'll, you know, you'll really, really resonate with it because the 20s is for many people a time of searching. Just multiply that by a thousand and you get Tolstoy. I don't know whether I read this in your book or somewhere else, but uh, the statement was made that there are 350 Tolstoy descendants in 25 different countries. I mentioned that because in 1931, his daughter Alexandra came to the United States. She founded the Tolstoy Foundation in 1939. She became a U.S. citizen in 1941. She lived to be 95 years old. Did you ever meet her? No, I never met her. I'm familiar with her and her work. Um, she did a lot to popularize uh, Tolstoy to keep his legacy alive in the United States. Um, but I never had the chance to meet her personally, unfortunately. So in this country, how how widely is he, I don't know the words, that admired or how widely is he taught? I know there's the Valley Cottage up in New York uh, where they have a school and there's a, there's a website you can go on and look at it. Young kids are there speaking Russian. Um, tell us what you know about uh, his presence in the United States today. So, uh, you know, I think, the two Russian writers that are um, most known and most read in the United States are Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Um, and I've taught both of these writers, and I've taught both of them both to you know, undergraduate students at, at, at a university, but also I've taught them to um, incarcerated students, uh, both youth and adults. Um, and so one of the things that I am struck with, uh, it struck by, is how incredibly relevant Tolstoy is to a really wide, wide, diverse group of people. I mean, I've even given talks and done workshops with corporate audiences, because there's a lot of wisdom about leadership. Um, in fact, Nelson Mandela was deeply inspired by War and Peace and by the character of Kutuzov. 
whom Mandela later described as the exemplar of humane and wise leadership. So, um, so I'm just struck by um, when people are introduced to Tolstoy, when they um, learn about him and read his works, um, it, they it just he resonates with with people from so many different backgrounds. I will also tell you that during the pandemic, Tolstoy was uh, there was kind of a res, um, a resurgence of interest in Tolstoy. So there was a general resurgence of interest in reading, as you know. Um, but War and Peace in particular was a book that many, many book groups uh, read and studied. And, um, and it became uh, not, it, it was, it, it became very relevant um, to people around the world, not just the United States, in part because I think it offers a very hopeful vision of human life, which um, in spite of all the tragedies that exist, which is a message that people needed to hear, but also because the story of of many, many people um, from different walks of life, many who don't even know each other, um, who somehow, whose journeys come together, who are on a shared journey, a shared human journey in a very difficult moment in Russian history. And that parallels what we all have been through in the pandemic. So, so uh, War and Peace was very, in the past couple of years, was very relevant. Um, you have a new yeah, book. So, you have a new book out, and you mentioned Dostoevsky. Uh, explain what the new book is called, The Gambler Wife. So, yeah, so after, so um, I, I had always been a Tolstoy guy, um, including, you know, up to the, the writing of the Give War and Peace a Chance. But as I mentioned, I also have a program where I uh, bring together university students with incarcerated students to study the works of Russian, you know, Russian writers. And it was through that experience that I developed a much deeper appreciation of Dostoevsky uh, because he himself was incarcerated. And so I became interested in him, and I started reading around in biographies, and I kept coming across the name of Anna Dostoevsky, his second wife. And the more I learned about her, the more I was shocked that she herself did not have her own biography. This was a woman um, who was Russia's first solo female publisher. The first, she started Russia's first book distribution business. She started the first literary museum, which would become the model of all future literary museums. She was one of Russia's first bibliographers. She was an extremely successful businesswoman who... Uh, published the complete collected works of Dostoevsky after his death, which earned her, in today's money, $5 million, which is extraordinary at that time for anybody in the cutthroat publishing business, but especially for a woman. And so I wanted to tell her story, and I tell it as a story, and it starts in the moment uh, when they meet, when Dostoevsky was 44 and she was 20, and he hired her as his young stenographer, to help him meet an urgent publishing deadline, which if he failed to meet it, he would have lost the copyrights on everything he wrote for the next nine years. And so from that first moment, and she succeeded, she helped him finish this novel called The Gambler in three weeks. And so from the minute she came into his life, she was instrumental to saving his career and his, his life, because Dostoevsky was even more of a mess than Tolstoy. Dostoevsky, you know... So anyway, we can talk about that. But um, so it is her story. Uh, it is a very modern story um, that's never been told before about a woman who was herself every bit as much of a gambler as her husband. The difference is Dostoevsky was a gambling addict, but she was a strategic calculating gambler whose gambles paid off uh, throughout her lifetime. Go to your classroom for a moment over the years teaching both men. Which one do the does the do the students like the most, and why? Um, that's a tough question to answer. I'll tell you, there's a there's a a poorly kept secret in Russian literary circles that you're either a Tolstoy person or a Dostoevsky person, but you can't possibly be both because their you know their their sensibilities, their aesthetic, everything about their writing is so fundamentally different that there's no way that you could resonate with one writer and the other at the same time. And I think what I've learned from personal experience and also from my students 
um, is that's not necessarily true. I think they get different things from each of these two writers. And I think one of the things that Dostoevsky does um, brilliantly is he reveals those dark, hidden psychological currents uh, beneath the surface of all of our actions. And for him, life is so much about a battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil, that battle that gets waged inside of every one of us. Um, and so Dostoevsky described the world of psychological extremes. He described the world uh, filled with collisions and cracks and, um, you know, the most extreme aspects of human experience. And I think um, certainly the incarcerated population um, resonates with that because many of them have had a life of extremes, a life of extreme suffering. Um, and so they resonate with Dostoevsky in that way. However, however... Tolstoy offers something else. Tolstoy also shows the struggle and the hardship of life. War and Peace is filled with scenes of human depravity and battlefields drenched in blood and everything. Um, but it is also a deeply hopeful vision of human life. Tolstoy was fundamentally optimistic about human nature. And so the students maybe turn to Dostoevsky uh, for you know, kind of a, a deep dive into the, the dark forces that underlie our world and underlie our own lives. And they turn to Tolstoy for solace. That Tolstoy shows us not only who we are, but who we can become. And I think in that sense, um, they offer slightly different things that can resonate um, with the same person. Also, when it comes to Tolstoy, he was not a fan of the great man theory. Explain that and then kind of contrast that with uh, Mr. Putin and whether or not the Russians think he's a great man. Okay. <laughs> um, so War and Peace, uh, you know, one of the goals of War and Peace, um, Tolstoy wanted to rewrite history. He wanted to show how history really happened. Because at that point, at that time in Russia, the history books, and especially history books that were published in French, basically presented Napoleon as, you know, a great leader who threw his strategic, his, his strategic genius and his calculations uh, was able to succeed, you know, to the extent that, that he was. Um, and Tolstoy said, no, 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 this is a misunderstanding. First of all, he said, Napoleon was not nearly as strategic or as smart as we think he was. And a case in point is look at what he did in 1812. He invaded Russia. He was so certain of his strategy that he was going to sub subdue Mother Russia. Well, what happened is that the Russians, in a very widely way, lured him deep into the Russian countryside. He made it all the way to Moscow, but he couldn't get out of Russia because the Russian winter destroyed, decimated his army. And so the Russian Tolstoy is showing have a deep sense of nature and are very in tune with nature. And they understood what Putin, you know, with his so-called strategy, could never understand. And that is those forces um, that don't lend themselves to rational understanding, such as the force of nature, which is what destroyed Putin, uh, Napoleon's army on the long winter march out of Russia. And so part of Tolstoy's agenda was to show that not only was Napoleon not a great man, but in fact all the people that make history are the people who never make it into the history books. History books are written by, you know, people that are known, people whose stories have been uh, documented in the historical record. But Tolstoy wanted to tell about everybody else that makes up a historical moment. And in fact, he said, those are the people who are most important to history. Those millions and millions of people who through their small everyday actions and decisions and struggles, in fact, are, are influencing the ultimate flow of events far more than any single great leader. Um, so that's, um, so that, was, uh, that was Tolstoy's take on the, great, the so-called great man theory of life. Now, you asked about Putin. Like I said earlier, of all the characters in War and Peace, the one that Putin most closely resembles is... Napoleon. Um, he has many of Napoleon's qualities, in, including, you know, uh, as um, you know, as Tolstoy described Napoleon, a great arrogance and a great confidence in his strategic genius. 
And the fact is, many of us have believed that. Many of us have praised Putin for his strategic genius. And it is only recently that people are starting to realize that, well, maybe he miscalculated in a major way, not unlike the way Napoleon miscalculated significantly by invading Russia. Only now the tables are turned. Russia is the invader. And so in that sense, it's very parallel to the story of war and peace. Um, I still think Russians uh, believe in Putin, the, the 70 percent of Russians that support the war. I think many of them believe in Putin's greatness or they want to. Um, I think they want to believe in a great leader. Um, I think this is, you know, kind of this is in um, this is something in, in the Russian blood um, that, you know, they have uh, centuries of a history of being ruled over by a czar. Um, and I think having a great a czar like figure at the helm gives them a certain comfort. So psychologically, I do think they do believe or want to believe in his um, greatness. And in defense, I will say this, in defense, not of Putin, but of you know, Russian policy, I will tell you that the, that the West did make mistakes over the past 30 years. It is true that in the 1990s, when Russia was struggling to reenter the world economy, they were struggling with privatization. You know, we were beating our chest and, and you know, and... Um, you know, proudly declaring ourselves the victors of the Cold War. And, and there was an arrogance there that was not helpful. And Putin still remembers that and draws on that to rile up his people. He remembers the humiliation that Russia experienced on the part of the West rather than our being, um, you know, much more generous victors and much more willing to try to help Russia reintegrate we focused on the fact that we won, and that was a mistake that we made. He wrote a book in 1899 called Resurrection. What, uh, what was the book, and what was the impact of it? Uh, so Tolstoy, you're referring to Tolstoy. Um, well, it's interesting because it, it, um, it is a story that opens up with uh, a young juror, um, by the name of Mikhlugov, who is listening to a case come before the jury, a case of a murder by a young woman of somebody who, you know, sexually um, molested her. Well, guess what? Mikhlugov recognizes that young woman. She was the woman whom he seduced when she was a virgin a decade earlier when he was visiting his relative on his estate. And so this is a novel about someone who is sitting in judgment who needs to search his soul and to be judged himself. And so uh, eventually um, he goes through a moral resurrection. He realizes that he was responsible for the circumstances that led this young woman to ultimately commit the murder because she delivered the baby on her own. She didn't have support. She fell into hard times. And as a woman in Russia at that time, that's what would happen if you didn't have any support. And so it's a novel of, of really kind of speaking to something deep in Tolstoy's worldview that every one of us needs to search deep in our heart and recognize that we are all responsible in some way for the fate of everyone in our midst. Um, and in Mikhlidis' case, it was very clear because he actually was the person who seduced her. And so the novel tells of his moral resurrection. And ultimately, um, he, I think he, he, mar he marries her, and, um, and she follows him to Siberia. And so in some ways, I think the novel ends a little bit too um, neatly or too idealistically. But the, the message is clear and important that this is a story. And, and that's also... Tolstoy's redefinition re, uh, of the word resurrection. Tolstoy didn't believe in all of the, the symbolism of the Gospels and the resurrection. He believed that resurrection is something that happens inside of us, that is based on actions that we can take to redeem ourselves. And so he was trying to redefine what resurrection means, um, which was part of his overall project of rethinking the Gospels 
and making them much more practical and much more applicable to every human being. Um, and it got him excommunicated from the, the Orthodox Church. It, you know, the novel was too much. There's a lot of criticism of, of the Russian Church and, and the Russian uh, Orthodox tradition. And sure enough, Tolstoy, because of the resurrection, was excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church. And to this day, he has not been reinstated. Explain this. Uh, Kirill, the primate of the Russian Orthodox Church, has been supporting the war in Ukraine on behalf of Putin. How can a religious leader do that, especially when 70% or so of the Ukrainians are Russian Orthodox? Well, how can a religious leader condone violence and murder? I mean, it is unconscionable. And Tolstoy had an answer to that question in Resurrection. That is exact. I, I need to be careful because I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, I'm denigrating the Russian Orthodox Church. But Tolstoy's view was that that is that was the problem with the church, that it got involved with power politics, and that was not Jesus's message. Jesus' message was about how all of us can look at one another in the eye and see first and foremost a fellow human being created in the divine image. And the minute the church starts getting involved in politics, in power politics, it is a corruption of that message, Tolstoy believed. And this is exactly what we see happening today in Russia. Um, I think the Russian Orthodox Church um, believes that their mission is not just to, you know, um, support believers around the world, but also to eradicate heretics, also to get rid of people, um, to remove people who are threats to the church because they're not believers. And, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put words into Putin's mouth, but this is why both the, the church is supportive of Putin's war because of how Putin has framed the war, that this is our, you know, uh, he calls it the denazification of Ukraine. Uh, we're protecting our Russian citizens abroad, by which, you know, Russians understood Russian Orthodox citizens. Um, but it's all so corrupt and so not true. Uh, and so I, I have a very personal reaction to that. I just think it's unconscionable for a church leader to support a war like this. Besides reading your two books on Tolstoy and your new one called The Gambler Wife, about Dostoevsky's second wife, those that have been listening ought to know that on YouTube there are a couple things you can watch that you might find interesting. One is a very old documentary led by Malcolm Muckridge, and it takes you through the uh, the property that Tolstoy owned and and also in Moscow. And then Alexandra, his daughter, has a BBC conversation that she held uh, many, many years ago. Both of those are on YouTube. Um, your new book's pub date is when? Well, so the new book uh, was published in August of 2021. Um, the full title is The Gambler Wife. A True Story of Love, Risk, and the Woman Who Saved Dostoevsky. Um, it's actually being made into a movie. It was announced in Variety in February. Um, and, uh, and I am, you know, I'm very proud to say it was a national finalist for the Pen America Biography Award, um, which was announced a couple of months ago. So the, the book is out, and the paperback is coming out in the fall. We're out of time. Professor Kaufman, thank you very much for the background on all this, and uh, we wish you the best in the, in the future of your novels and your books and your movies. Thank you, Brian. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org. Thank mm-hmm. you.